Hi guys, it is Tamara. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the seven ways that trauma makes it really difficult for you to heal. Now, this is a subject that a lot of my clients and people who consult with me want to learn a little bit more about. And part of that is because there isn't a lot of videos on YouTube that really focuses on healing trauma. It's usually, you know, how do I understand trauma? How do I define trauma? How do I, you know, kind of live with trauma? But there's nothing really on the ch on YouTube channels that specifies what is preventing the healing. So I want to kind of provide some information to fill that gap in today's video. So let's just go ahead and jump in. Thank you so much, as I always say, to all of you who are subscribed and participating. And for those who are new, I encourage you to hit that subscribe button so you can stick around with us and be a part of our growing and validating community. Now, in case you don't know who I am, let me go ahead and briefly introduce myself. My name is Tamara, and I'm an internationally and board certified trauma therapist, but I'm also licensed in mental health, and I specialize in treating children, adolescents, and families, as well as adults with childhood trauma. Let's jump you think about things that um, kind of prevents mental health and emotional healing for trauma, um, what comes to mind? A lot of people look for positive or negative types of escapism, which I will post in the description box below um, my two videos that I recently did on negative and positive escapism. But a lot of people look to escapism to help them cope with trauma. Trauma is basically a fear response. And it's a fear response to something that has triggered you and you have absolutely no coping skills or the ability to cope with or to deal with. Okay, fear is a trauma response most of the time for individuals who are dealing with trauma. It's a stress response, a trauma response, whatever you want to call it, that happens when you don't have the coping skills or the ability to cope appropriately. And what happens is you begin to develop physiological symptoms, psychological and emotional symptoms, and sometimes you begin to develop symptoms that are somatic, meaning, you know, they are occurring within your body, but there's no medical proof that you're actually having these physiological symptoms, right? You feel it in your body, but when you're put in an MRI or you're given a CAT scan or your blood is tested, nothing comes back positive. So sometimes fear really is a trauma response for those individuals who are dealing with trauma or who have had, excuse me, a traumatic childhood. Now, I think it's important to keep in mind that fear is sometimes a good response. Fear quickens you to situations that are not healthy, that may be threatening, that may be violent, and that may be ultimately unhealthy. So sometimes you may have that internal fear and not know why, and you may also try to minimize or decrease that fear by psyching yourself up and saying, I don't know why you're so afraid, that's over. Or I don't know why you're afraid, this person is wonderful, you know? Keep in mind that that fear response may actually be a healthy response that's trying to warn you of something. So fear is pretty complex. And, you know, if you look at research on the psychology of fear, the philosophy of fear, and the spirituality of fear, you're going to find three different definitions of fear. I'm not going to define them in this video. I'll try to put something in the, in the description box for you. But you're going to find different definitions of fear. And some religions, as well as philosophies, believe that fear can actually be healthy. And I'm one of those therapists who believes that fear can actually be healthy. I think it quickens you, it puts you on your toes, and it gives you the insight that you need. So um, keep that in mind as we go along. So let me just point out uh, seven things that kind of get in the way of you healing from trauma. It prevents a proper healing. It prevents post-traumatic growth, which is something I discussed right up here in this video. And I'll try to put some things in the description box for you below. But let's go ahead and jump into this, okay? So the first thing that prevents you from healing from trauma that really is 
um, at the core, a fear response is a bad psychotherapist. Now, what I mean by this is there's a couple of things that can, that can further traumatize you and make you afraid here. One is a psychotherapist that has absolutely no idea how to set proper boundaries. Now, you may get a therapist who is very rigid, very conventional, you know, um, maybe a little bit racist and prejudiced and discriminatory. And you may get a psychotherapist who is really um, stoic. You know, they don't show their emotions on their face. They don't show you what they're feeling in, in their heart. They just sit with this defense wall up. They look at their watch and they say, see you next week, right? That kind of psychotherapist has its place, I think, with certain populations and people and cultures and races, but it's not appropriate and healthy for all other races and cultures, you know, um, or age groups even, or populations, right? So, you know, a bad psychotherapist can really keep that rigid, conventional, defensive wall up and prevents you from really connecting on a heart-to-heart -heart level. Now, we can also swing to the opposite side and say that there are those psychotherapists who are too much like a best friend, too much like an aunt, a sister, a mother, like an individual who is unhealthy. You don't want that kind of um, therapist because you're not gonna get what you need from them, okay? The next is something known as iatrogenic neurosis. Iatrogenic neurosis, and basically the idea behind that is that you know you go to a psychotherapist who actually makes your problem worse. They don't know how to heal you, they can't heal you, and whatever they've been utilizing with you is making it worse. Um, there's actually a movie uh, that I will post in the description box below, and it's about a doctor who wasn't very healthy psychologically. He might even be characterized as a sociopath, and he made his patients more sick. And, you know, it was it was like this cycle in his life. Um, so there are some doctors and psychotherapists who, who can unintentionally make you worse and some doctors and therapists who can intentionally make you worse, unfortunately. Not everybody in the field has a good heart and a good mind, you know? So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing is transference and countertransference. I talk about that a bit up here in this video if you want to see a little bit more information on that. Uh, but, you know, when you're dealing with transference, and here's the definition of that, you know, you really have to have a psychotherapist that gets what's going on that has proper boundaries and knows how to be fluid they know how to change with your needs they know how to change uh, you know with you know the times or with the progression of your treatment or even the regression of your treatment so you have to have a therapist that's pretty fluid and experienced the next thing is misdiagnosis you can get a psychotherapist who misdiagnoses you and you know that can lead to a series of challenges and difficulties in your life so a bad therapist that's number one All right guys so let's go to the next one okay so the next thing that kind of um, interferes with your motivation to go far and beyond your fear would be negative escapism. Go ahead and check this video out right up here. I talked a lot about the negative aspects of escapism and some things that you are likely to to engage in just to numb the pain and help yourself move from one place to the next. Well, negative escapism is basically a way to um, minimize, uh, displace, compensate for, uh, minimize, internalize, I probably already said minimize, all of those emotions and thoughts that come along with the trauma. So you're most likely going to engage in things that are not healthy for you, sex, um, drugs, overeating, um, under eating, which then in turn creates an eating disorder. You get to lose weight. So it's kind of reinforcing of the eating disorder. Um, negative forms of escapism could be something like overspending, shopping too much, um, codependency. Like there's, there's a variety of ways that you can engage in negative escapism. So you will see in that video, I break it down and I explain as I go along why it's a, a negative form of escapism okay so negative escapism now there are different categories i like to put under number two uh when i discuss this topic with clients and under negative escapism would be sublimation that's basically 
when you take, um, it's a Freudian concept, okay, here's the definition of sublimation, but it's basically when you take an unacceptable impulse and you redirect that energy into something that is acceptable. So instead of domestic violence or instead of taking out your anger on your wife or your husband, you go to the boxing ring and you just let off all kind of steam. Um, another form of sublimation may be, you know, um, you have low self-esteem and you have all these internal feelings of resentment that you haven't been able to work through. You haven't been able to fully understand. So what do you do? You try to go into modeling and you may even go a step further and get into prostitution. It's a little bit more acceptable than something else. You know, or you may go into modeling because that's a little bit more acceptable than prostitution. So you take that socially inappropriate or looked down upon uh, emotion or behavior and you take and redirect it into something that's a little bit more socially acceptable. OK, so that's something likely to happen in this category. Another thing is denial. We know what that is. Uh, fantasy, imaginary friends, wishes that never come true, but you're going to keep wishing and hoping. Uh, fantasy could really go uh, so deep as to cause another identity within yourself. You know, you're having a little bit of a hard time facing your trauma. The fear of facing your trauma is causing you to retreat and go within, go inside and to withdraw is what I'm trying to say. Um, and as a result, you engage in this negative es escapism, you know, because you don't really want to face the trauma. The fear has you run in the opposite direction. So what do you do? You create this elaborate fantasy about your life and your world. And you may even get so sucked into that fantasy and that lie that you begin to engage in what I talk about here up here in this uh, pretty, you know, frequently watched video pathological lying you may begin to lie because you're beginning to believe your own lies and so that's an issue so you may do that now another less common way that you may engage in escapism would be by utilizing alters okay so you know an alter ego olivia you know or an alter ego raymond you know you may you may kind of put yourself out there in the world as somebody with an alter ego because it's a little bit easier to stand behind the shield right this is the shield and this is you so it's easier to function back here if you're catching what i'm trying to show you than it is to be right here up in the forefront getting hit with criticism and racism and discrimination and judgments and refusals and you know uh, rejections discouragement more trauma more pain right it's easier to just stay back here and let your alter ego get hit by all the things that you're afraid of okay um so that's category two negative escapism and i call it negative because sublimation denial alters and fantasy really can set you on a road to years and years of, of a need for continual treatment okay so um that's why it's negative it's not really a healthy way to deal with trauma the next category would be dreams flashbacks and memories one way that you can kind of protect yourself from having to face the fear of your trauma or having to face any internalized emotions would be dreams, flashbacks, and memories. It's really difficult to get to the core of your trauma if frequent dreams or frequent flashbacks or frequent memories are getting in the way in such a way that it derails your ability to focus on what needs to be focused on. You know, I think um, I've had maybe a couple clients, maybe a handful of clients over the past few years who really struggled to address their trauma in therapy. And instead of, you know, taking baby steps with a therapist and trusting the process, they started having repeat dreams that they would kind of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They would kind of, um, somehow derive, that's the word I'm looking for guys, derive meaning from the dream that either wasn't healthy or realistic or truthful at all, you know, but the dream would be a, a little bit of a barrier to kind of protect them from having to explore their trauma further. Uh, flashbacks, I'm having so many flashbacks that I can't function, I can't continue therapy. And while that may be true, right, these things can be true, 
you know, there are some situations where it isn't true. It's more of a defense mechanism and memories, you know, just kind of going back in your mind over very painful memories. And it, it brings to the forefront these emotions and these thoughts and maybe dreams and flashbacks that you can't tolerate. So it's almost like the person in therapy is so afraid to address the real issue that they get far ahead of themselves and they start worrying and panicking about what they're going to have to come in contact with during the course of healing that they they immaturely and immediately in their treatment because of these dreams and these memories and their flashbacks so that's a little complicated um but uh, if you guys have questions let me know in the comment section below i'll try to answer them but yeah this happens sometimes and it's 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 something that gets in the way of continual treatment okay the next thing guys would be self-diagnosis and provider shopping now provider provider shopping is basically the idea that i'm going to hop around until i find the provider that's going to give me the diagnosis that i think i deserve there are some clients like this some patients like this they will continue to hop around until they get the answer they think that they need they have self-diagnosed um which is difficult because you know that that level of education that a provider may have um on a variety of diseases and disorders and mental illnesses uh it far exceeds what a patient or a client can find online you know google is correct sometimes but google is also limited because it doesn't have the medical and psychotherapeutic tools that providers get in graduate school and college and residency. And so that makes uh, the patient or the client a little limited in how they self-diagnose. But some people think they can just Google something, go to WebMD or mentalhelp.net or psychcentral.com or you know the American Psychological Association's website and just learn some things and they feel like they have the diagnosis that, that, that matches what they're going through. And I can talk about self-diagnosis, guys, if you want to see a video on that, let me know. I can also put that together for the next round of videos. Um, but when that happens, you know, it kind of gets in the way of focusing on what the real issue is. You can't focus on the trauma because you've already given yourself a label of PTSD. You can't focus on the acute stress because you've already given yourself a label of PTSD. So because of that, and because you have your mind made up and you have a label that you want to attach yourself to where you feel like you you are a part of you know that kind of gets in the way of treatment so you know that's another barrier and sometimes fear does that let me hurry up and diagnose myself and figure this out because i just want to know what's wrong with me or let me go ahead and diagnose myself because they don't know what they're doing anyway and they're probably going to give me this label anyway you know and while those things may be true and there may be some truth to it um again it's still limited information so um, self-diagnosis can really get in the way and sometimes fear drives that self-diagnosis and, and that hopping around from provider to provider okay the next thing guys would be a uh, childlike demeanor uh, some individuals who have really extreme childhood trauma uh, struggle with becoming an adult they really struggle with um, navigating the world as an adult uh, stepping into shoes of an adult um, managing their lifestyle as an adult um, raising their children as an adult, they really struggle. And so, you know, that leads a lot of people who are dealing with severe, severe childhood trauma down a child line, a childlike, I should say, um, journey. I'll put it that way, or a childlike hole. And it's a rabbit hole and it continues and it continues. And unfortunately, these individuals can't get to the actual trauma because there's a lot of childlike fears. There's a lot of childlike insecurities. There's a lot of childlike barriers and defenses that really gets in the way. And sometimes these individuals um, are made rather sick by their trauma to a point of needing to be hospitalized until they are stable. They may go under a desk and hide. They may hold a teddy bear and walk, rock back and forth, right? Um, they may cry and scream on the floor like an infant. Uh, they may scream, I want mommy, I want daddy. I had uh, a client who was about 45 years of age years ago when I worked in a psychiatric hospital during my training, my internship and practicum and i was new to the field i had no idea what i was getting myself into i was really a baby and i was given the huge responsibility of you know caring for individuals um you know who were adults who had schizophrenia and really severe mental illnesses and there was a woman who was i think i said what 45 and she went under my desk and she rocked back and forth with a teddy bear in her arms and she screamed at the top of her lungs i want my mommy and it's like her trauma took her mind all the way back 
to when her dad was beating her mom and she was rocking back and forth with her teddy bear in her bed screaming, make it stop. And so um, that trauma for her stayed with her for years and she maintained for lack of a better word, she maintained a childlike demeanor. And that really got in the way of trauma treatment. She couldn't navigate that and she couldn't get past that. And so, you know, we had to stop treatment. And unfortunately, hospitals, you know, when they can't hold you anymore, they let you go. And so she got passed on to another therapist. So, um, you know, it's really tough when individuals are struggling with, with deep-seated childhood trauma because those kind of things can happen. Um, a next category would be sarcasm and displacement. Displacement is, you know, taking your true internalized emotions and displacing it onto something else or somebody else. Um, you know, you can't deal with the emotions, so you take and ball up your emotions and internalize and push down your emotions until you can get to a place where you can displace it onto maybe your boss or your neighbor or your children or something. Um, sarcasm is another um, is another tool that I think people with trauma sometimes use to deal with fear and insecurity. You know, be be sarcastic about being abused. Be sarcastic about being beat to death. Be sarcastic about the wreck that happened four times because your dad was an alcoholic. You know, um, sometimes it's easier for people with childhood trauma to be sarcastic and to displace than it is to just be serious and say, "I'm broken. I'm hurting." You know, um, another thing would be dissociative disorders. And I have a couple of videos. Here's a video right up here in the cards that I did about dissociative disorders. And if you search through my channel, you'll find more videos. Some of them are really controversial because I touch on topics that a lot of people don't like. And sometimes I throw around the word multiple personality disorder uh, just for the sake of talking about the history of the disorder. Uh, but um, you can go back to those videos and learn a little bit more. I'm going to talk a little bit more about dissociative disorder. So let me know in the comment section below if you want to hear more about that. That might be the next video, actually, uh, just to kind of give you, some knowledge, give you some knowledge about that as well. But I think fear drives dissociative disorders as well. If you're severely traumatized or you've had a severe childhood trauma, dissociative disorders you know, they're likely to happen to you and fear is going to drive them. Um, and usually, you know, people who have things like dissociative amnesia, where they lose touch of where they're at, who they are and who everybody is around them, you know, they're usually triggered by it, by, by the fear response, the fight or flight system. So when I talk about dissociative disorders in more depth, I'll go ahead and talk about that fear response as well. Thank you so much for being with me today, guys, in this video. I encourage you to give it a thumbs up if it was helpful and go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can stick around with us and um, I will continue to talk about these things guys um, and as we move along I'm going to ask you to continue to vote I think you guys like to vote because you get exactly what it is that you want and I'm not just putting videos out there for the sake of it I will continue to just put put videos on my channel but I'll also try to get your input as well through those voting polls so thank you so much for voting on those and I'll see you in the next video bye